Amon, described as the seventh demon in Ars Goetia, a chapter in the anonymous grimoire, The Lesser Key of Solomon, was believed to be a great and mighty Marquis that ruled 40 legions of demons in the underworld. The demon has a rather unconventional appearance, as according to the account in Ars Goetia, Amon can appear in a multitude of forms. First, he is described as appearing with the body of a serpent and the head of a wolf, or the body of a serpent and the head of a hawk. But simultaneously, he is also described as taking on the form of a man with dog's teeth. With such a bizarre amalgamation of forms, it does make one curious as to what these combinations meant and why the demon chose to adopt these particular characteristics. Could there be a deeper meaning behind Ammon's chosen manifestations, or is this the work of an imaginative early modern writer in an effort to create something so uncanny and bizarre that one couldn't help but classify it as a demon? Whilst the early modern period in which the Lesser Key of Solomon was believed to have been written witnessed the beginnings of the Renaissance and the Reformation periods, religious beliefs remained particularly potent when shaping the perceptions of evil and demon kind. The Catholic Church, who at the time were making an effort to reinforce their own ideals against the Protestant Reformation, did not shy away from using the reality of demons to illustrate their points. Put simply, this was a time when traditional doctrines were reaffirmed, including the existence of demons, in the hopes that this would combat not only the Protestant uprising, but other perceived heresies, including witchcraft. Despite not being a religious book, a book as comprehensive as The Lesser Key of Solomon may have piqued the curiosity of the average believer of the time, and some may have even found some solace in knowing the enemy. On the other hand, the book was also believed to have been used by those on the other side of the fence, sorcerers and summoners, who were believed to be using these demons to aid them in seeing the future, healing ailments, or getting filthy rich. Such is the nature of the demons found in this dark grimoire, and as we can see by delving into Amon's section, he certainly fits right in. We are told, the seventh spirit is Amon, he is a Marquis great in power, and most stern. He appeareth like a wolf with a serpent's tail, vomiting out of his mouth flames of fire. But at the command of the magician, he putteth on the shape of a man with dog's teeth, beset in a head like a raven, or else like a man with a raven's head simply. He telleth all things past and to come. He procureth feuds and reconcilieth controversies between friends. He governeth forty legions of spirits. His seal is this, which is to be worn as aforesaid. This is one of the first demons that has its personality outlined by the author. Amon is stern. He probably isn't the kind of demon you'd want to summon on a whim. And there's an implication here, based on the fact that the previous demons haven't been described in such a manner, that Amon would really be an unsympathetic entity to have an audience with. If that wasn't enough to dissuade a summoner from seeking out this demon, his appearance alone might have done the job. The demon's primary form is a wolf with a serpent's tail, but this imagery isn't the only unsettling thing about it. It doesn't just breathe fire, no, it vomits fire, suggesting that not only does the demon not have control of the flames that it spews from its mouth, it's also probably prone to setting things on fire unintentionally. With this alone, Amon becomes one of the more dangerous entities to have around, considering that based on this description, it's one cough away from arson, and maybe even setting the summoner alight too. At the command of the summoner though, we are led to believe from the description that Amon does swap his flaming mouth for a mouth of a set of dog's teeth inside the head of a raven on top of the form of a man. Either that, or just a man with a raven's head. In this form, there is some suggestion that Amon is calmer and probably more inclined to aid the summoner with his requests. Of these requests, Amon is noted as being able to tell all things that have happened in history and all things that will happen in the future. Indeed, this makes him quite the powerful entity to have around, assuming you were able to get him under control and may even justify the risk of being burned alive by its unruly vomiting. Additionally, another reason one might choose to summon such a demon as Amon is because he was believed to have been able to repair damaged friendships 
and put an end to ongoing feuds. Depending on how desperate someone was to reconcile with a lost friend, or bury the hatchet, summoning Amon may not have sounded like such a bad idea, even with the risks involved. Of course, as far as traditional beliefs go, associating with or entertaining demons isn't just a dangerous thing to do, but it's also a transgression against one's faith and their god. The fact that demons like Amon do favours for humans might seem all well and good from the perspective of the summoner, but to traditional Christian values and beliefs at the time, these creatures would have been labelled as evil and insidious, dark entities who promised power, riches and all sorts of temptations in their efforts to lure humanity away from God and further into their clutches. As is customary, we are also told of Amon that this is his seal and that those who summon him, as with all demons thus far, must be wearing it. According to French occultist and demonologist Colin de Plancy, his classification of demons known as Dictionnaire Infernal tells us much of the same account as found in Ars Goetia. However, de Plancy does make some notable distinctions. For one, he notes that when Amon morphs into its human form, only its body is human. Its head, on the other hand, comes to resemble that of an owl. He also notes that Amon is the most solid of the princes of demons, which gives us the idea that he's less of a Marquis and more of a demonic prince. The strongest demonic prince, no less. So far, we've only encountered one prince, and that's the demon Vasago, who controlled 26 legions of demons. As Amon was said to have controlled 40 legions of demons, it does further reinforce Amon as the Prince of Princes, and suggests that Amon had more a realm of influence in Hell than Vasago did. Much of the Plancy's account follows the same structure as Ars Goetia, but he does add that this Amon was the same Amon worshipped by the Egyptians, a deity who was revered as the King of the Gods in Egyptian mythology. Amon was considered to be the most powerful deity in the Egyptian pantheon, where he would later come to be known as the Concealed God, he whose nature could not be known by anyone. Because of this elusiveness, he began to be associated with the air or the wind, elements that could be felt but never truly held. The concept was that Amon was everywhere all the time, but he could never be perceived, at least not by the human eye. Because of this, Amon was frequently painted blue to demonstrate his invisibility, and it was with such invisibility that Amon became more like the idea of the monotheistic deities found in modern day Christianity, Judaism or Islam, always there but never actually seen. Amon's importance to the Egyptians also stems from the idea that he was the creator god and first brought everything into existence by mating with himself leading to him also being referred to as the self-created one. Meanwhile, Amon is also mentioned by Dutch occultist and demonologist Johan Weyer in his 16th century classification Pseudomonarchia Daemonum. Here, Weyer's account mostly follows the same as the Plancy's and Ars Goetia's, telling us, Amon, or Amon, is a great and mighty Marquis, and cometh aboard in the likeness of a wolf, having a serpent's tail vomiting flames of fire, where he putteth on the shape of a man, he showeth out dog's teeth, and a great head like to a mighty night hawk. He is the strongest prince of all others, and understandeth of all things past and to come. He procureth favour, and reconcilieth both friends and foes, and rule forty legions of demons. Having dived into the historical representations of Ammon throughout societies, some even as old as the ancient Egyptians, we are witness to a dynamic interplay between religion, folklore, and even the human psyche. Whether feared through the lens of early modern Christianity, or revered through the eyes of the 17th century occultist, these demons such as Amon serve as a prism through which enable us to analyse the evolving perceptions of the supernatural throughout time. As always guys, if you've enjoyed today's episode on Ars Goetia, be sure to leave this video a like and don't forget to subscribe for more content just like this. Until next time.